let's get started. Uh, all right, so some people say that we are all here. Let's get started. Okay, uh, indeed. Uh, so let's get started. It's uh, our pleasure to have uh, Stefan Zeng, uh, who is a lead research scientist at uh, Salesforce, uh, to give us a presentation about uh, their recent work uh, about AI economists. Uh, uh, so, uh, Stefan um, uh, focuses on deep reinforcement learning and simulation-based learning. Uh, and uh, as, as the talk shows, uh, this is done for designing economic policies. Uh, he holds a PhD in physics from Caltech uh, and interned twice uh, with Google. And, uh, his research uh, covered uh, during his PhD imitation learning for long-term planning basketball and uh, exciting stuff, uh, neural network robustness amongst others. Uh, before machine learning, he studied mathematics and theoretical physics, uh, the University of Cambridge, Harvard University and Utrecht University. And he received the Lawrence graduation prize uh, from the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences for his master's thesis on exotic dualities in topological string theory and was twice awarded the Dutch National Eugene's uh, Scholarship. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to have you, uh, Stefan, here. Uh, we are looking forward to your talk. Uh, thanks, Sava. Thanks so much for that kind intro. Um, and thanks so much, everyone, for organizing this event. It's uh, really awesome. I listened to Emma's talk, uh, really interesting stuff. And I'm very happy to present the AI Economist to you today, which is uh, a team effort with a lot of great people here that you can see. And hopefully um, I will talk about some of the exciting results that we found. So in a nutshell, this research is trying to simulate an economy millions of times over to create fair tax policy. And from a technical point of view, we're trying to do two level reinforcement learning for adaptive policy design. And altogether, at a very high level, we hope that this is a first step towards evaluating policies in AI simulations to make future policy making less ideological and more data driven. Uh, and the reason we are taking this AI approach is um, basically that economists and policymakers today try to improve economic outcomes, but often their tools are uh, very limited. So data is an issue, uh, economic data. Uh, there might just be not enough of it. Uh, secondly, if we look at traditional economics, they often use very simple reductive models of people, companies, governments, and other institutions. And thirdly, it's really hard to experiment in the real world. So we cannot run to parallel versions of the United States uh, just to see uh, what a control group does as opposed to some other policy that we might propose. And in particular, if we look at the world, uh, one big motivation for us is that um, one of the biggest socioeconomic problems today is economic inequality. So if we look at the incomes in the US, uh, historically, uh, the top 1% has seen the income grow much faster than the bottom 20%. And this is actually a global trend, uh, as you can see on the right. Now here, inequality just means how much the incomes uh, per year differ between different workers in the economy. And productivity is just the sum of all the incomes. And we can see that this gap is growing and uh, there are many, many downstream effects, uh, negative downstream effects because of this, which are well documented. And so taxes are a key government tool to improve equality and to minimize the harm that these downstream effects can cause. But this is actually a very hard uh, optimization problem. So you can use taxes to transfer wealth from the rich to the poor, but at the same time, if you do that too much, then taxes can discourage work and uh, decrease overall productivity. So if you plot equality uh, and productivity in this uh, two-dimensional plot here, then there's this 
create a boundary where uh, beyond which you cannot improve one without hurting the other. And in this work, we basically look at four different ways of setting taxes such that we get, uh, first of all, as close as possible to the pre to boundary. And then hopefully we can also control the point on the boundary that, it, that we end up with. And this is a really hard problem. Um, and the, if we look at the his, history of tax theory, um, the seminal work in 1927 uh, basically provided one of the first mathematical treatments of uh, how you should set optimal taxes to uh, balance uh, these forces in the economy. Uh, and this was written by Ramsey. It was named uh, A Contribution to the Fear of Taxation, quite a humble title, but it's actually considered a seminal work in that literature. And the way we, um, the way the paper tries to solve the problem is that it tries to maximize social welfare, which we can think of as the sum of all the rewards of the agents in the economy. Um, and these agents are in some market. And then the government tries to raise a set amount of tax. Uh, and what Ramsey showed is that if you make some approximations, for instance, you can assume that the uh, utility of every agent is uh, locally quadratic. Uh, then you can actually derive explicit tax formulas. So here utility, we can think of it as the reward that an agent experiences. And the key point that Ramsey showed is that taxes should be inversely proportional to the elasticity. Uh, elasticity means how sensitive how people are to a change in the tax rate. Uh, then in 1971 and 2001, there has been more uh, theoretical work where people try to get away from these uh, sort of linearization assumptions and uh, you know so there's nonlinear taxation and in particular the assumption that people make there is that people have different skills so people make different amount of money per hour depending on the quality and the, the difficulty of the job they do and what they showed is that you can actually derive optimal nonlinear tax formulas um, and again the the property of these formulas are is that they are proportional to the inverse of this elasticity um, the limitation, though, is that they typically uh, limit themselves to a single tax period. So it's uh, like a bandit setting, if you will. Um, and the economy is quite static. So everyone is in equilibrium, like a, in a Nash equilibrium, uh, an, an analog of Nash equilibrium. And then very recently, and in the past 10, 20 years, um, in economics, people have also started looking at dynamic sequential economies. Uh, in particular, the new dynamic public finance, uh, you know, by Golosov and Kotler Koda, um, consider the sequential setting. So this is closer to the MDP setting in, in RL. Uh, and also, there's something called the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models, and these models basically look at shocks like recessions or education, where people might uh, increase their skill by going to school, and other effects um, that, like you know, like investing or you know, interest rates. And what you see in this is this broad trend that in 1927, people had simple models and you could derive close form solutions. But as you go to these dynamic sequential settings for these e complex economies, there are actually very few analytical solutions and explicit tax formulas uh, you know, that you can derive. And this is where we try to use reinforcement learning instead to have a data-driven solution. So I can pause here for just a second to see if there's any questions. Um, and I'm not sure if, if uh, I, I'm happy to take questions in between or I can just go. Um. I think as I, I will try to monitor the questions. Um, so far, so good, I think. No questions okay. so far. OK, great. So so the, the, the point of this work is that we want to try to take a, a reinforcement learning approach to this optimal taxation problem. And there are two ingredients, uh, simulation and reinforcement learning. So I'll first talk about the economic simulation we built for this problem. So here it is. So we see this two-dimensional top-down view of the spatial world. And we have four agents here that are running around. Uh, they are gathering resources like stone and wood. And then they build houses. Uh, and building houses gives you money. So you can see the orange guy in the middle is building a lot of houses in the middle. And then the dark blue agent in the bottom left, for instance, is uh, walking over these trees and stone that yields resources. And then he also built some houses. And at the same time, 
that agent could also decide to sell those resources to the other agents. So that's the reason this orange agent can build a lot of houses, even though he's not actually picking up a lot of resources himself. And at the same time, there's also uh, a government uh, controlled by the AI economists that will set income taxes and subsidize agents, um, you know, transferring wealth uh, that it gains through these taxes. Now, the, the simulation actually uh, has a number of low level details that are uh, important to uh, talk about. Uh, so for instance, these resources will stochastically respond in empty source tiles and there's some fixed probability uh, that you know, yields uh, wood and stone. And then secondly, uh, all these activities that these agents can do like moving around, gathering resources and building houses will actually cost some amount of labor, some amount of effort. So for instance, if I move one tile, it costs me 0.21 in some unit of labor. Secondly, there's a trading mechanism. So this works kind of like a commodity exchange or a stock, a stock exchange, if you will. So every agent can buy and sell resources by submitting a bid or an ask to the, to the exchange. And then it, there's some market uh, mechanism that determines how bidders and uh, uh, bidders and askers can get paired up. And again, if you place an order, this will cost you a small amount of labor. It's less than moving around because sitting on your computer trading is not as intense. And thirdly, these agents can build houses. So an agent can turn one wood and one stone into a house that creates a house tile on the map. And then this actually gives you a lot of money uh, but the amount of money that you get actually depends on how good you are at building it. So there's a building skill, a number that you can think of as the hourly wage or the, the pay that, that the agent gets for building that house. And uh, at the same time, building does cost a large amount of labor, uh, 2.1. So it's 10 times as expensive as uh, moving around. Now together, uh, these numbers feed into uh, how happy uh, these agents are uh, with the money that they earn. Uh, so here's a, a breakdown plot. There's a lot of uh, luck going on here. Uh, so in the top row, we can see a movie reel of the simulation that I showed you before. Not exactly the same one, but something similar. And in the middle row, you can see how much each agent worked, how much money they uh, accumulated, and how much utility that you uh, agent experienced over time. So each episode here takes 1,000 time steps. Um, and then there are four agents, orange, yellow, uh, and then light and dark blue. And you can see that if we look at the happiness of each agent, as each agent makes more money, it also has to work more. And so there's this law of diminishing returns, which basically models the idea that uh, just like in real life, you might work on weekends to earn more money, but the effort might actually not be worth it to you, right? There's this diminishing uh, utility that you get from an extra money. And I'll show you the ex explicit formulas later, but the, the crucial part here is, is that there's this diminishing uh, returns. What that leads to is emergent specialization. Uh, because of this uh, law of diminishing returns, some agents actually see that it's not really worth it to them to build a lot of houses, but instead it's actually more uh, profitable in terms of utility to sell their resources. So we see that one of the interesting uh, emergent phenomena from, the, from this is, is that if you have reinforcement learning agents in the simulation and they maximize the utility, specialization emerges. Um, and this is also apparent in the bottom. So if we look at the third row, we can see how much uh, was traded in this economy. And positive bars here means that that particular agent sold a resource and received money Negative bars mean that the agent actually paid money. So he lost money, but he got gained a resource. And we see that in this picture, the fourth agent, the one all the way to the right, actually spent a lot of money to buy a lot of resources. And all the other agents mainly sold resources to that agent. Okay, uh, we do have some questions. Uh, so right. Thomas uh, Gilbert asks, uh, can you discuss, justify some of the assumptions behind the simulation? They seem a bit unrealistic. Market economies have not existed for millions of years. In fact, badly for five generations. People do not, in fact, build houses to make money, etc. Uh, 
So I guess, uh, yeah, the question is, uh, how did you decide about uh, the rules of this simulation? Uh, what were you trying to incorporate and uh, how, how did you do this? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so for us, um, there's two objectives. We want to show that we satisfy the basic uh, modeling uh, features or model features of an economy as is discussed in the optimal taxation literature. Um, so that means that you need some, uh, just like Ramsey, there needs to be some sort of mechanism by which, uh, first of all, agents can uh, earn money. And secondly, these agents need to interact with each other in some way. So I need to be able to trade with you, for instance, right? And this uh, makes sure that resources are allocated efficiently in this world. So the way we chose these particular ingredients and put them together is that it's sort of the minimal set of features in the economy such that you can study this trade-off that people study in the optimal taxation. But you're right that you know it's not it's not the real one. Um, yeah. Yeah. My understanding was that you you try to come up with a simplified setting which are somewhat realistic. Uh, like uh, maybe the amount of uh, goods, like there is replenishment of resources, but but that's all. That's the input uh, to the system that makes it grow, I guess, or sustain itself. Uh, but for example, agents are not printing money or anything like that, uh, right? That's right. Uh, that's right. So, okay. Um, so another question is what utility function is assumed for agents in the model? My related question was uh, what information was available to the agents? Uh, because you said that these are reinforcement learning agents, so they are optimizing their utility. It must be based on some observations that they have about like the whole state of the economy. And uh, my question was uh, perhaps related to this other one. What is the information? And then what is the utility function that they are optimizing? Yeah, uh, I, I will give you all the details in a couple slides down the line. Uh, if it mean, basically, uh, in a nutshell, the utility function is a uh, power law um, over post-tax income. And the observation is uh, local. So the agent can see in a small neighborhood around itself um, it can see tax rates and you know see how much it owns, but not so much what other agents own and so on. So, but uh, yeah, there's no like global information, not much global information uh, regarding. Uh, so that there was this question about that uh, millions of years, what not. Uh, so how do you respond to that? Uh, uh, that that a simulation. I, I assume that the question refers to that. Here, the simulation needs to last for many, many, I don't know, simulated years, um, which is not realistic. Uh, but, but I guess uh, maybe there is an answer to that. Yeah, um, I guess in particular, we chose 1,000 here uh, together with the coefficients for the utility functions such that every agent can experience a maximal utility. So at some point, the agents uh, decide to stop working, so to say, in these simulations. But you're right that uh, you could have more time steps if you wanted to, or a more streaming version of utility. There are many possibilities. That's true. I would have imagined that you would say that uh, in the real world, there is a lot of parallel simulation going on, so many more people than the number of agents. So what was the number of agents that you used in this simulated economy? So here are four. Yeah. So I think that like you can trade off between you know, learning speed and like people are spreading information, teaching each other. You can parallelize a lot of this learning if you have lo lots of agents and then they're kind of uh, spreading information about what strategies work, what doesn't work. And of course you, ha you are in a simplified setting and uh, therefore your time span is going to be larger but your spatial span is much smaller. Uh, so that, that's a trade-off that you chose, uh, but I guess, uh, yeah, like uh, from the perspective of the conclusions you want to, to reach or like the hypothesis you want to examine this probably shouldn't matter that much. Uh, I don't know. Well, what do you say? No, I, I think that's right. Uh, so uh, for us, this particular setup, all the choices we make are basically to demonstrate that two-level reinforcement learning is a very powerful optimization technique that takes 
adapt adaptability and strat strategic behavior of these agents into account. Um, and the, the choice of utilities and, and other features of the economy in some sense are just there to make sure that we see that trade-off between equality and productivity in the economy. Um, so we, we don't claim that this economic simulation is necessarily like the real world. It's more so a vehicle for us to demonstrate uh, the potential of this reinforcement learning approach. And, and, and also like that, what kind of trade-offs, uh, even a simple model like this uh, leads to? Uh, there was another question that was related to the very first one uh, by Sven Hartenstein. Uh, uh, could you clarify why to use this wood and stone economy? You mentioned the DSGE models, uh, which base their structure parameters on empirical findings, which still is quite a tough to exactly identify those parameters mapping to deep behavior parameters of agents. On which basis do you assess your parameters driving productivity of your agents? I guess you sort of un uh, answer this uh, question. Uh, uh, if I understood the question correctly, how do we choose the parameters? It was just to show, uh, let every agent experience some the maps of their utility curve within this episode. And yeah, I guess you know. I guess maybe the point of the question was that economists have been really busy trying to fit models uh, to the real world, and uh, those are usually really hard to fit. They have many parameters, uh, and then you come with this. Uh, like simplified setting compared to maybe uh, some of these economic models. Uh, and wh why did you choose this as opposed to uh, something that is out there in the literature? But I guess like we discussed, because your purpose is, is a little bit different. You're not trying to model the real world here. That, that was not your point, right? That's right. Yeah, it, it's more like a study of like, like, hey, let's understand what this could, could lead to. Uh, what insights could we gain? Uh, I don't know, like I'm, I'm just uh, trying to understand, yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, the last question, does uh, specialization emerge from some comparative advantages in toad on the agents or is it just an outcome from trading? It's definitely a related to trading. The trading gives the uh, agents optionality. They can either build or they can sell, right? And that's what the RL agent experiences. And, and you know, some agents decide to just sell and other agents decide to build a lot. I'm also guessing that it's also necessary for the agents to have different skill levels or, uh, or maybe have you, have you tried the, the simulation when all the agents were homogeneous? And then the question is whether in that case, uh, specialization would arise? Maybe it would, right? Uh, who knows? It, yeah, it, it depends also. I mean, the, uh, this, the skill distribution is something that uh, taxation theory assumes and it leads to, it's, it's one of the biggest reasons for inequality, right? Like if everyone has all the resources they need, but they still, uh, you know, uh, and they can basically fulfill their own utility curve, right? Then the skill distribution will lead to a uh, still in the distribution of incomes. So that's one factor. Um, the specialization can emerge in other ways as well, depending on the geometry. So you can imagine that some agents only have access to stone, the other agents only have access to wood, right? And, and they basically understand that, that they need to specialize in trading certain resources to each other, for instance. All right. Um, one last simple question. <laughs> Uh, from Thomas Gilbert. Uh, can agents communicate? Uh, he couldn't tell if emergent specialism was pure self-interest, introspection, or strategic in a more multi-agent sense. So no communication. All right. No okay. teachers or... No. Yeah. Uh, but th there is some local observations, and local observation involves... Uh, when, when you're observing that there is, so you said that you're like the agents are observing their local neighborhood. So you mean that they know about the existence of resources in the neighborhood um, and other agents potentially, what the other agents are doing or, or not that much uh, about the other agents, just their existence. Uh, yes, they know that an agent is there. Uh, they see resources, uh, they can see other houses. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, 
Good. Thanks. Awesome. Think... All right. Yeah. Great questions. Yeah. Keep coming. <laughs> All right, so um, just a brief aside on, on simulation. So one of the first ones to consider simulations of economies. So there's a rich literature on, on Asian-based modeling where, uh, yeah, like most of these simulations are actually quite simple. They typically don't use AI to the extent that we have used it. Um, and, and what they very really, what, what Abins are really interested in is studying emergent phenomena. So the idea is that I would put a lot of agents, very simple interaction rules uh, together, like on the right, like a lot of point particles. And uh, just like in physics, when we have a lot of simple things, but you put a lot of simple things together and together they can actually, uh, you know, lead to really complex uh, behaviors uh, as a group. Um, so there, there's been some literature on, on, again, using simple ABMs with optimal taxation, but again, they, they typically are much more simple and they don't use reinforcement learning and they don't really explore the strategic aspect as much as we do at uh, both the Asian level and at the um, taxation level. Um, and uh, thirdly, I'll mention that there has been some uh, work by Janus Assel from DeepMind in 2018, who basically also used deep learning uh, to, or deep Q learning to understand the tax evasion behavior of firms. Um, and one way to understand it is again, is that that's sort of one level of reinforcement learning. So. Um, yeah, so there's, there's some really interesting work that preceded this. So uh, now let's go to the RL part. Um, and uh, I'll, yeah, I'll be brief about this slide. I'll just say that we use uh, active critic methods. Uh, so we try to train in uh, parametric policy, uh, both for the agents and for the entity that are setting taxes in this world. Um, so what does that mean? So for the agents, um, let's, let's look at their objective function. So agents have different action types. They can build, move around and gather uh, resources and we can index them with alpha. Then there's some skill. So for the IF agent and the skill uh, indexed by alpha, um, these, this agent will uh, basically earn some money every time it, it sort of uh, does that. <clears throat> then the agent also works. Uh, so there's different types of labor associated with every action type. And also the tax uh, denoted capital T is a number uh, that you know, tells the agent how much uh, it should pay uh, in that given state S of the environment. And together you can then compute the post-tax income as just skill times labor minus the taxes that you pay. And this feeds into the utility function, which is a function of post-tax income and labor. So the, the, the income part is this power law. So eta here is a constant bigger than zero. And uh, the labor is then subtracted linearly. And if we, uh, in a very simplified cartoon, if you only uh, have one source of labor, you just um, connect them all together and make them one parameter, you can see that the CRA function has this uh, hill-like behavior. So for different skill levels here, uh, you can see that the maximum will be a different numbers of hours worked. Um, so so that's, that's another way in which these agents are basically differentiated from each other. And then the objective for these agents is just their uh, you know, typical RL objective where the reward is the increase in utility. So one thing to note here is that these uh, income and labor things are cumulative over the course of an episode. And so the instantaneous reward is just how much your total utility uh, increased that time step. At the same time, we have this government and the, this government is gonna set marginal tax rates tau and these taus are going to uh, determine what these capital T is, the full amount of tax that each, each agent pays. And the planner has a, a slightly different objective. So the planner looks at social metrics like equality and productivity. And again, uh, these, uh, this reward is the instantaneous improvement in these social metrics. Um, now, how do you compute that? Uh, if we take all the post-tax incomes X, you can compute the so-called Gini coefficient. Uh, so the Gini coefficient is a normalized sum of absolute differences between the different uh, incomes of all these agents. And then the equality is just one minus the Gini with some um, normalization here. Productivity is just the sum of all the incomes. Now, I probably don't have to 
preach to the choir here, I guess. But you know, the benefit of RL is that really this objective is completely flexible. So uh, one of the things here uh, is that you know you can have sustainability, social mobility, helping the middle class, anything that you can quantify and put into a reward function can be put in here and given to this uh, government or social planner as a optimization objective. And another detail here is that this is akin to a Stackelberg game. So that means that the, over the course of an episode, we can think of it as like a number of years that are being played out. And at the beginning of each year, the planner first sets the taxes for that particular year. And then the agents have to play the game. Um, so this is uh, just like uh, the real world. Now, one uh, point I want to sort of uh, make here is that when we think about multi-agent learning, there's a lot of um, related notions in terms of optimality for fixed set of reward functions. So in games, there are Nash equilibria, where basically at optimality, uh, no agent wants to unilaterally change its strategy. Uh, and in Marcus, it's actually, there's something that is uh, from a technical point of view, philosophically the same, uh, namely the competitive or well Russian equilibrium. And you can think of this as basically the idea that demand meets supply in a competitive market that's efficient. And another example are auctions where uh, you can, you can you know, sell paintings and, and you can try to find some uh, set of rules in this auction such that nobody lies about their valuation uh, and the bid they uh, bring out for that particular thing that's being auctioned off. But if we look at the theory here, uh, very often the, you know, the literature tries to uh, prove some sort of existence or uniqueness or other properties of these optimal policies. But it, analytically, it's very hard uh, to explicitly describe the optimal policy. Um, and you know, in, in reinforcement learning, we try to use this uh, strategy to go from a random policy to the optimal policy as defined in some way. But the point here is, is that these reward functions are fixed. <clears throat> now, on the other hand, there's a uh, academic field called mechanism design and uh, also called reverse game theory, where the goal is rather to think about what types of rewards and dynamics will induce nice equilibria in the policy space of the agents. For instance, you might say, well, what are all the reward functions and rules in an auction such that all the agents are actually telling the truth? Uh, again, the trend here is uh, maybe clear now that it's often very hard to mathematically derive uh, a closed form solution for the correct mechanism. Um, and in this context, we can think about the AI economist as actually learning how to set rewards and therefore it's learning the optimal mechanism and simultaneously taking into account what the strategy of the agents would be as they learn to go to optimality under that mechanism. And a helpful analogy here might be that you know, we can think of GANs, where the discriminator also learns to separate real from fake images by constantly adjusting the loss function that is seen by the generator. Um, and I'll say that, that our collaborator, David Parks, also has work uh, in this area where he used deep learning to learn optimal auction mechanisms. Uh, but um, they didn't use reinforcement learning. So they didn't look as much at the uh, strategic part where the agents have to learn under that mechanism as the mechanism changes. <clears throat> so one word about income taxes. And so um, basically taxes work like in the US and also like in the Netherlands, I'm from the Netherlands and in both cases it work this, works the same. Um, and um, in, the, in the middle, you can see a depiction of the tax schedule. So what that means is that if I make a certain amount of money, each a uh, portion of my income is going to be taxed at different tax rates. And in the US, there are seven buckets. So um, uh, we're showing here the uh, income buckets uh, divided by 1,000. And these were the buckets that were in, uh, valid in 2018. So for instance, if you made money uh, between $204,000 and $510,000 a year, then that money in that bucket would be taxed at 35%. And um, yeah, it's the same, the same logic for the other buckets. Uh, so all the models that we considered in this work uh, basically choose how to set these tax rates, right? But we keep the buckets uh, the same for all the models. 
<clears throat> now, the, 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 all these agents, uh, both the workers and the social planner, uh, use deep learning. So you know, we use neural networks to uh, take the observation that all these agents uh, had and then output a set of probabilities over all the actions that were available to them. Um, and uh, this basically hopefully answers the question that was asked before. So there are different types of information in this world. So first there's the public map, which is this top-down view that we saw before. Um, now the planet can see everything. So where all the resources are and where all the agents are, but the agents can only see in his neighborhood around themselves. Secondly, there's a public state. Uh, so the tax rates and the prices in the market are visible to everyone. Uh, and in particular, the agents all are subject to the same taxes. So there's no, there's no individualized taxation in this world. The third category is semi-private states. This means that every agent has a certain endowment. This means like how much wood, how much stone do I have? And that agent can see that. And the government can see that as well. But other agents cannot see, um, they cannot see each other's endowment. So that's why it's called semi-private. And then there are also truly private states that only the agents can see. So only agents can see their own skill level and how much they've worked, how many hours they've worked. And all this feeds into a pretty conventional uh, ConfNet, fully connected layer, uh, an LSTM unit, and so on. And here's the two-level part. So the, as I mentioned before, we use reinforcement learning at two different levels. And at the inner loop, we have these agents that are observing the state in the world. And they're deciding whether or not they should move around, buy or sell resources, collect something or build houses. And they take the tax rates in the world as an input. And they learn in this inner reinforcement learning loop. At the same time, there's an outer loop here where the planner constantly looks at the state of the world as I just previously described. And then in its actions, it's going to adjust the taxes that are being set in the world. And in particular, these taxes then influence the reward that these agents see in the inner loop. That makes it two level. Now, this is a pretty big machine learning challenge because um, as the reward functions change, the optimal behavior under that reward function also changes, right? So in economic terms, uh, if you work this, let's say 40 hours a week, you might've made some amount of money for that. But then as the taxes change, you know, the next year, uh, that same amount of work can then give you less money or more money. And um, uh, yeah, again, sorry. Yeah, yeah um, just finish the sentence. And... Oh, right. um, I yeah, I wanted to say that the, the, the reason uh, that the learning challenge, learning is, uh, it's, it's an issue is that there's this constant back and forth between the social planet and the agents as they try to adapt to each other. Yeah. So. Sure. Uh -huh. A uh, couple of questions here. So Wilder, he is uh, not sleeping, asks uh, whether uh, the collected task, uh, is the collected tax spent on anything? Is there a redistribution of VAS or the tax is just like disappears? It's this? redistributed yeah. equally. Yeah, that's one point I didn't mention, but the total tax that's collected in a single year is equally distributed among all the agents in the world. I guess that's going to impact uh, maybe the outcomes as well, right? So if the dis redistribution was not equal, but it was based on, I don't know, whatever, uh, like the needs of the agents, uh, then uh, maybe, I don't know, like would, would the results, would you expect the results to, differ to be different? Have you looked at that? We have not looked as deeply at different subsidization schemes. We did try to learn it all the way in the beginning, uh, but then we found that it's actually really hard to uh, have a you know double double the action space, if you will. So we said, let's make the subsidy side simpler. Um, so we didn't look too much into uh, different schemes. Yeah. Uh, and a different question from Robin Chowan. Uh, he asks whether the spatial uh, nature of the environment. Do you expect it to have a big impact on the results or not? Uh, have you looked at that? You it know, doesn't you have this environment. 
Yeah, it, it does have an impact. Like there could be spatial bottlenecks, for instance. So if you really adversarial, you could block off access to resources to other agents. Um, you, you know, the proximity of an agent to a resource matter. So you can use uh, barriers, for instance, to restrict access uh, to resources. So the, the geometry does matter a lot in terms of what the agents can actually do. Uh, and a question from me. Uh, so this is a game uh, in, in many ways. And uh, although it's a stackable barrier game, uh, I guess uh, maybe I'm figuring out the answer as I say, but uh, so the agents are acting uh, simultaneously. And so if you have simultaneous action games, then maybe uh, you need to randomize or whatnot. Uh, so were these agents randomizing? And if not, then wouldn't that be you know, like something to consider or, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so the agents here uh, were sharing weights, uh, but they had like uh, different inputs, so to say. So the, it's a conditional. So yeah, so, so the, the agent model, uh, they use the same weights, but with different uh, you know, inputs. In, into their model because you know they're different it's like a palm dp if you will so you know in a way you're not you're looking at not the dynamics necessarily but uh you look at this problem as an optimization problem and and you try to uh see uh what comes up uh if you're solving this optimization problem uh Okay, uh, I see. Uh, I somehow missed that detail. Uh, but still, the question is whether uh, it would be worthwhile for the agents to randomize. You know, in rock, paper, scissors, you would randomize because otherwise you're going to be second guessed by others and you're going to lose. Uh, or maybe this environment is so complex that it doesn't really matter. So would you imagine that randomization would change the nature of the results uh, if we added randomization here, or it wouldn't uh, actually matter? It depends on randomization in what sense. If you randomized... Your individual actions, right? Indiv I see. Um... I think in this particular environment, the, the, the driver for specialization is so strong like there's such a clear um, benefit of, of you know specialization. You're giving information about yourself using your actions, and also thinking about uh, with the text, right? So you could randomize a little bit, show that you are lamer than what you are, and uh, I don't know. Yeah. And then, uh, I think yeah, that, that's a really interesting thing. Like I, I guess we, we haven't really observed that agents learn to create uncertainty for the planner or something like that to be better off, um, right? That's something that we haven't really seen. Um, I think the dynamics are such that just the, again, the urge to maximize utility, right? Leads, such, such, leads to such a strong advantage to these agents to do one thing um, that basically that doesn't, doesn't seem to occur in this particular setting. But I, I don't, you know, maybe for more complicated settings that does become interesting for the agents. And one final quick question. Uh, so the outer loop uh, that involves the government, is that working on a slower time scale or same time scale? Like adaptation yeah, rate for? Yeah, it's, it's a slower time scale because the uh, basically there's a task year. So it, when, if you remember the episode was 1000 times steps. So there are 10 years of 100 steps each and a planner acts once every year and the agents act 100 times every year so the time skills are different right that's it thanks okay great so what do you see if you actually run this well this is a very characteristic uh, behavior so we see four uh, social welfare curves uh, in the top so the AI comments is in green, and then the other baselines are in uh, blue, red, and purple. So the social welfare is equality times productivity. And you see that what, what's happening here is that the system starts out with some pre-trained agents, and then the planner also starts to learn. 
So all these models start off from the same initial uh, level of social welfare. And then if we look at the AI economist, we see that the social welfare actually does not just um, monotonically increase. We see that it actually goes up and it goes back down again, and then you know it rises again. Now, the reason for this is that these agents in the beginning don't actually know how to respond to taxes. So in the beginning, there's a sort of an exploit that the planet can find, but then the agents start to adapt, and then we this, uh, this back and forth dynamic uh, kicks in. So we see that this is um, a very characteristic type of behavior for uh, this two-level learning setup. Um, you can see that the other, uh, the red and the purple don't really suffer from this. And then the blue curve does seem to have a little bit of that. Um, and I'll explain in a second why that is. Um, and you can see the same sort of trend for productivity and equality separately. So how do you go about mitigating this instability? Uh, we found that there are a couple things that are uh, useful uh, and a lot of other things don't seem to work as well. Um, so the first one is that you do two-phase training. So as I mentioned, you first train the agents in an environment without any taxes, so uh, fixed reward functions. And then you start to train the planner uh, after the agents have converged into the, in the first phase. The second thing is curriculum learning. So the agents slowly uh, see the cost of uh, work increase in phase one, and then the planner slowly increases the taxes over time. And this is just to ensure that the reward function is not too uh, penalizing at the beginning of each phase. And the third thing is entropy regularization. Uh, so this is very common, but we found that um, you need to actually carefully tune these entropies and especially uh, relative to each other to make sure that the agents explore enough and don't give up prematurely because they see a big penalty uh, because of taxes that might be too high. Uh, in some uh, episode. Now, uh, I see I'm, I'm probably a bit short on time, so I'll, I'll skip this. I'll just say that uh, there's a rich literature on multi-agent learning that is uh, particularly relevant to what we've done, um, but uh, I'll, for the sake of time, I'll skip this and actually go to the results. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison of uh, these two uh, environments that have different taxes. On the left, there's a free market, no taxes at all. And we see that the social welfare here goes to 1,258. And the pie in the middle shows you how welfare uh, or the wealth is distributed in this world. So we see that the dark blue agent builds a lot of houses and he gets about two thirds of all the wealth in this economy. And then the size of the pie also grows uh, proportional to the amount of uh, total um, income, the productivity. On the right, we see the AI economist, we see that it gets much higher social welfare, but also the distribution of wealth is uh, more equal. So the dark blue agent, for instance, get just, um, just over half of the wealth in this world. And we see that in aggregate, this AI economist actually um, consistently improves this social welfare over all the baselines. Um, so if we compare it to the SAS model, it improves 16%. Uh, that's when it's boxed on the right, and then even more compared to the other uh, models, the free market and the US federal taxes. So for the purple bar, uh, we just used the tax rates as set in 2018. Um, I will explain in a, in a bit where the blue uh, one comes from. And the other uh, the graphs here show you that if we look at productivity, the free market is actually the most productive. People, you know, in total, society makes the most money. Uh, but it's actually very unequal. So if you turn on taxes, you will hurt productivity, but you actually improve equality. And that together leads to higher social welfare in the end. Here's a visualization. So uh, what do these tax models actually look like? But in purple, you see they use federal taxes. So it's a progressive scheme. So tax rates go up as you make more money. Then in blue, there's a SAS formula where taxes actually go down in this particular setup. Um, and then the AI economist actually learns uh, something that's qualitatively different. It looks more like a W or a U. Uh, so the taxes are high in the beginning, then they're low in the middle, and then they're high again at the top. Um, I'll say that here the tax rates are actually an average because again, there are 10 years in a simulation. So, uh, but this pattern here is quite consistent. On the right, you can see that this uh, slightly different tax 
schedule actually leads to higher subsidies. So um, on the right, you can see how much money each agent uh, has to pay uh, after also taking the subsidies into account. Um, so negative means that you get money and you see that the, under the green points here, the agents uh, on average get more um, or the lower skilled agents get more than under the other tax schemes. And again, uh, the tax money that's collected by the government is redistributed equally uh, each year. Now, one word on how you get the blue line. Uh, again, I won't go through all the details here because of time, but the way um, the, the blue line is, is created is by following the recipe given by Saez in his 2001 paper on awful nonlinear taxes. So the idea there is, is that you can derive this closed form formula for the marginal tax rates. Um, again, uh, it's a fraction and the G and the alpha here are uh, basically parameters of the income distribution in the world and also a function of the so-called social welfare weights, uh, small g. And the E here is the elasticity. So elasticity, if you might remember, is the sensitivity of a worker to a change in the tax rate. And if you compute all these things, uh, so you can estimate G, alpha, and E all from the uh, data that you get in a simulation, you end up with this a regressive tax schedule. Um, now, it turns out that in uh, economics, this elasticity is actually the uh, key player. This is actually one of the most important parameters that people try to estimate. Um, so in a nutshell, uh, elasticity is basically how much the uh, income changes when I change the tax rate. So it's like formally speaking, this differential. Um, and one way of estimating this, uh, this, this E is basically by doing an ordinary least squares on a rolling data set of income and tax pairs that we've observed in the simulation. Uh, so you can derive that there's this uh, linear relationship between uh, the log incomes and the log taxes and this elasticity is basically the slope of this, of this curve. And what you get is that like um, the elasticity is somewhere between 0.8 or 3. Uh, there are other methods actually to estimate this. And then these are fed into the SAS tax. Um, <clears throat> so finally, what's so interesting about this is that we've seen that this AI economist does actually pretty well. Um, but this is despite the fact that these AI agents actually learn to be strategic. Right? These RL agents don't like to pay taxes. That actually reduces their utility, just like in real life. And so they find these strategies that allow them to pay less tax uh, over the course of an episode. And in particular, uh, you know, one of these agents has learned that if you report uh, high and low incomes alternatingly, then you actually get a lower tax burden over 10, uh, again, over the course of an episode. And all the baselines that we uh, just mentioned actually don't account for these kinds of temporal strategies. For instance, in the SAS framework, the economy is supposed to be static. And so that means that people would not be able to uh, execute these kinds of temporal strategies, basically. And the framework just simply does not allow for that. Um, and again, you need to make that assumption because otherwise you cannot actually derive an analytical tax formula. Um, okay, so we also tested this out with real people. So we asked, Okay. Maybe let me uh, quickly. Uh, we have two questions. Uh, yes. Uh, both are uh, concerning equality and, and the way you're measuring it. Uh, so how how did you? Uh, so first of all, there was some graph uh, or results uh, where you were showing uh, something uh, related to productivity and equality together. How was that defined? Was was it the straightforward sum or? Yeah, like that, that graph uh, over there, yeah, with the bar chart. Productivity is and just a so of all the income. Productivity were defined before. Uh, I think we understood the, that. Uh, the okay. next, uh, uh, there was a bar chart uh, where somehow they were together. Uh, I think it's further down. Uh, yeah, here. Yeah. Uh, equality times productivity. It's the, the, the product. Uh, uh, which is uh, being optimized by uh, government here, right? AI yes. Is yes. Uh, so I guess uh, the question was, how, like, how do you justify that you take the product? Uh, 
because that is going to lead to some point on a Pareto front, but like, why, why the product? Right. right. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a choice. I mean, it's intuitively, it's the function that um, uh, increases, right, as both equality and productivity increase, right? So on the Pareto front, basically, um, to go towards the Pareto front, like, you know, you can follow equality against productivity. Um, but you can like, remember that right? So you can combine equality and productivity in many different ways, exactly. uh, such that the result is in, monotonic in, in each individual component. Uh, That's right. And so we just chose this because it, it's simple. Um, it, it works, so to say. Um, we, we could have, we, we've tried other variations of this, but uh, we didn't really see qualitatively different, like, mm -hmm. things. And again, the, the point of the paper is to show that for a given social welfare definition, you can do this technique and find interesting solutions that are better. But yeah, we couldn't, mm -hmm. we could have tried other ones as well. Um, we just didn't have time for that. So another question was, uh, so where these uh, qualitative trends are robust to changing the measure of equality? Have you tried any other measures of equality? Uh, not the Gini index. We, we chose uh, the Gini index because it's a widely accepted economic metric. Um, we haven't really looked into other definitions. And the miscellaneous question, have you ever looked at uh, how uh, AI economists are like this whole model would respond to shocks uh, that uh, are like the 2008 financial crisis or just now what we're experiencing this year, this COVID? That's a great question. Um, yeah, I, I, we, we didn't look too much into that, but I think that's certainly, that's one of the things that's so fascinating about this, what would happen if we consider harder MVPs, if you will. Yeah. All right. Uh, whoa, okay. Uh, lots of more questions. Uh, okay, uh, Thomas Gilbert asked conceptual question. Do we have to assume the Pareto curve is fully deterministic? Uh, I'm not sure what that means. The W shape proposed by the AI economist could instead be interpreted as suggesting four or five distinct positive thresholds for public policy interventions, e.g. specific trade union protections arbitration, rather than strict cut-ups for utility optimization, e.g. marginal tax rates. This might imply more than one social welfare definition. Okay, I sort of... Um, I, I didn't completely catch the question. I guess, I guess the, 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 the point was, can we interpret this tax schedule and use this as inspiration for a slightly different way to employ taxes? Uh, I'm not really sure if that was the point. Yeah, it's, it's not entirely clear to me, uh, but looking at the solution of uh, AI economists, this, this W-shaped curve, uh, I'm thinking about that. Uh, maybe some people wouldn't like uh, to see such a curve so, uh, but at the same time, if, uh, so it's, I kind of find it interesting that uh, if you set, uh, set the goal as, as you did to optimize this overall measure, uh, which was uh, this product of uh, equality and productivity, uh, then you end up with a solution like this. Uh, the question is whether if you would constrain uh, the tax curve, to something like monotonically increasing that people would think is a priori more fair, uh, would that uh, lead to a worse uh, solution in terms of this measure? Have you tried uh, to impose any such restrictions while doing the optimization? And like, would it be worthwhile to, to try doing something like this? We didn't try uh, having a neural network predict part of the, you know, the you know, some structural constraint or having some structural constraint, we didn't really try that. Um, I think that would be interesting to see, but in a way, right, the, the, the friends, like, would this limit? Thing. Sorry? So do you, do you think that uh, there would be a fundamental limit to what you can achieve if the, the curve was monotonic or was it just like 
oh, this is one of the solutions that we have found in life, fine. Uh, but maybe there are multiple solutions, who knows? Uh, maybe there are even better solutions. It's a complex system, right? Yeah, and I think that, that that's just a thing that requires more investigation. In a way, I think that the nice thing about this is that you don't need to have any sort of priors on what good and bad tax looks like, right? You just let the RL agent just figure out what it wants to do, and then you see what happens. Um, I guess good explaining it to uh, the layperson uh, if you get a curve like this. Exactly. And Especially that, I think, if you have to be a very good politician to uh, to be able to do that. Right. So I, I think that's, that's yeah. I will get to that like later. Um, but I think that's actually where a really interesting line of future work lies. Right. Is that on the one hand there's human priors about fairness and and what fair should look like. Right. And then there is basically how you get there. Right. What's what does a policy look like? And then uh, sort of like repeat. I think the in a, what I said in the beginning. The, the goal here is that we want to focus the discussion more around what are the goals and constraints in society, right? And then we just let the AI just find a solution. And then as long as we're happy with the goals and constraints, then, you know, then whatever happens, happens, right? In a way, that's sort of a one way to think about it. <laughs> Although I yeah. you know, there's a lot of like ifs and buts, but, but yeah, I mean. Lots of, lots of caveats uh, in terms of whether we are able to write down the objective that we would later not regret writing down if we, you know, just let things happen. Uh, but I, I think it's great. Uh, okay, I, I think that all the uh, questions were answered. Okay, great. Uh, I do want to get two things across, so I'll just uh, I'll be quick about this section. Uh, we did try this in a simulation, uh, and by this I mean a simpler version of the simulation. Uh, with, but then with real people controlling the agents and making real money. So every house would actually give people 10 cents and so on. Um, and we found that actually there is a, uh, another solution that you can find with the AI economist that actually transfers uh, well to this uh, simulation with people. Um, so if you look at the performance in social welfare, you'll find that the AI economist outperforms the baselines but with a bigger variance in the results. And that's because basically people are not as consistent as AI agents. They're much more adversarial, they, they block people. And so the outcomes in human studies tend to be much higher variance than with AI agents. But still there's this trend uh, where the AI economist does well. Um, here's a different metric that also shows this. So um, inverse income weighted utility is just a weighted average of all, all the utilities of agents in this world. And then on that metric, the AI chemist also does uh, better. And uh, again, there are a lot of details here, but I'll, I'll refer for uh, all the details uh, to the paper. So uh, the final point I wanted to make is that um, the future, uh, if, we, if you will, and, uh, and again, economics is not a discipline that's actually using a lot of AI. Uh, they're just starting to appreciate the, the benefit of these tools. And so we hope that uh, this, this work shows them uh, that reinforcement learning is actually a very powerful tool to design economic policies in very complicated uh, economic scenarios. But before we can actually use this in the real world, we will still have to do a lot more work, right? We have to improve the fidelity of simulation. We have to incorporate real data. We have to think about how you would actually use the policy discovered by AI in the real world. And uh, to your point, Saba, how would you encode social values into reward functions? It's not very clear what the right way is. On the other hand, for uh, AI researchers, we hope that this work is a uh, motivator to look more into these types of social welfare issues. And um, there's really interesting technical depth to this, to this problem. Um, and you know, some of the things you can think about is that how you, do you actually do efficient and consistent two-level reinforcement learning. Uh, we've seen that the curves goes up, up and down. Um, how do you deal with a reality gap where the simulation actually is not the same thing as the real world? How do you then still manage to transfer a policy well to the real world? How do you explain economic policies, right? A really big thing is that, that if somebody has to pay twice as much tax on the AI economist, how do you explain that? Like, why is that, why is that happening? And then there are also uh, many multi-agent dynamics like cooperation, coordination, so on, partial information. All these things are ingredients in this economic setting as well. And finally, um, when we do this type of 
reinforcing learning, we might imagine that you want to do safe exploration and not violate any sort of ethical constraints, for instance, or understand, again, how you encode them and make sure that the policy that you end up with does not actually violate those constraints that we've set. And these still remain open areas for future research. And I'll close out by saying that we open sourced our code for the economic simulation, uh, the first version. So you can go to GitHub and take a look. Uh, we also have a public Slack channel and email address. So if you have any questions, you're absolutely welcome to join us and, and just chat with us there. Uh, we are also organizing a workshop on machine learning for economic policy at NERPS this year. Uh, so you, this website, machine learning for economic policy.com has all the details. And we basically are asking more broadly how machine learning can help develop more effective economic policies. How can we build better simulations that reflect the real world in a better way? And we have a great lineup of speakers here. I won't go for all of them, but it's uh, you know, phenomenal speakers. Um, and I'm super happy that we have uh, gotten the opportunity to organize this. So um, yeah, if you're interested, please join us there. And also I'll do a small plug for my collaborator, David Parks. So he is hiring a postdoc also to work in this area. Uh, again, to explore some of the questions that I alluded to uh, before. So if you're interested, you can contact David Parks directly or go to his website where he has all the details on this postdoc. So that was the last bit. Uh, if you want to know more, there is a website that we have where we, uh, again, talk about the research directions that we think are super interesting. Um, the paper's here. And yeah, if you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email and I'm happy to take questions now. I'll stop there. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so in the meanwhile, Robin asked the question, Robin Sean. Uh, do you think it would work well? Uh, it would work as well if the social planner was formulated as a bandit agent instead of a full RL, or why not? Uh, I hmm. think it's probably worse because we've seen that the agents have these these temporal policies right like you see that an agent can lower its tax burden by going uh you know different uh you know having different incomes working different numbers of hours every year and i my, my intuition here is is that keeping track of that history uh lets the planner adapt better to those kinds of temporal strategies i i my guess is it's harder to you know, encoded in a contextual bandit, for instance. Um, but yeah, because like you, you need to really see the pattern over time over many years. Um, so yeah, I had that related question of uh, did you add any exploration uh, for the agents to you know explore a little bit, or is it all greedy? What's happening? Just no, an optimization. Uh, that is happening. And we added entry yeah. regularization to both the agents and the planner. So it's all on policy. So we just sample from the learning policy and yeah, there, there there's no, no other special okay. exploration tricks other than entropy. Yeah. The exploration needs, I see. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, it's uh, very inspiring. Uh, yeah, there, there was one more question. I think you partly answered that. Uh, which was uh, about whether uh, you can imagine some scenarios where you could ethically uh, deploy something like this in the real world. Uh, so, you know, like, how do, how do we make the next step when, like, I guess you're proposing that maybe uh, we should, we could use AI uh, for uh, optimizing society, various aspects of it. And I really like this idea. Uh, but there are, of course, a lot of ethical questions that come up. Uh, and uh, so I guess uh, the person who asked the question was wondering about, have you considered the ethical implications of uh, deploying uh, something like this in the real world? Yeah, that's a great sec. My backup slide on ethics. <laughs> Uh, yes, we have considered that. We actually have a, an ethical review in our archive uh, paper uh, where we, we did talk with a number of academics and, and other researchers about this. Um, yeah, there, there, you know, there are a lot of 
concerns that you could have um, because we're talking about real people and, and their economic welfare and so on. Um, yeah, so so definitely uh, we, that's a big thing. Um, I think we have to think very carefully and 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 also talk with economists and, and policy experts and other people that you know the policy would apply to, right? Um, and and yeah, I think I think it's it's going to be a very um, careful discussion that we need to have. Um, but I think we think it's worth it. Um, and, but we do have that ethics review where we talk about, um, you know, what if you have biased data that you fit a simulation to? Um, mm -hmm. What if taxes are not anonymized, right? What if taxes are actually uh, use your name as an input? Is that fair? And how, how do you even detect that if that's happening, right? Like that, it's very unclear uh, right now. So yeah, and I would just say um, the paper has a lot more detail on that, but it's super very important. So there is a technical, interesting technical point by Rene Carmona. Uh, he is asking uh, whether uh, we could maybe model the interactions between the agents uh, using mean field theory. And so instead of uh, being local, the problem would become this mean field game, uh, which we could possibly imagine solving analytically or numerically, and, and this would, you know, potentially change the outcomes. Uh, have, have you thought about any such formulations uh, at all? Yeah, that's super interesting. Uh, thought about it, yes. Uh, done it, no. Um, <laughs> but I think that that's, yeah, there's a great line of research there as well um, on, on simplifying the multi-agent problem, right? The, um, there, there, there's, yeah, like if there's, there's Franz Olihu, um, there's, uh, I think, Shimon Weizen. Um, there are a bunch of papers that have appeared in the past years. Actually, it's a very old subject. Like, I think uh, Peter Sunahak, one of the papers that I quoted in my slides has valid decomposition networks, which also thinks about how do you, how do you make the problem simpler, right? By, by assuming some structure in a Q function or other ways of, you know, assuming something about locality and, and all these things. Yeah. And it, I think that's super interesting. We just haven't had time yet to, to, to try that. Okay. Um, good. Well, I don't see any, any other questions and we are a little bit past time. Uh, so I think we should let people go, uh, but thank you so much for, for the talk. It was super interesting uh, for me, for sure. Uh, and excited to see more work on this in the future. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. This was really fun. A lot of great questions. So uh, I hope that I gave a, a, an appropriate answer. And if not, uh, you can always email us at um, the email address. I'll, I'll, if I feel okay, I'll flash it briefly here. You can always email us and, and uh, ask one. By the way, I don't know. Um, I can send you the Discord. Uh, I don't want to overload you with anything, but I can send you the address of the Discord server. Maybe you can log in and then if there are further questions, then you could answer those uh, later on. Uh, I don't know. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. If you sent that, I will, I will join now. And then, uh, you know, if anyone has questions, I'm happy to answer. Cool. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, thank you again. Thank you. All right. I'll see you in Discord.